Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Outer Fool and welcome to the launch of the Mercedes EQE SUV. Now, you may have already seen this launch with Thomas, but I was speaking to a couple of guys earlier from Mercedes and they tell me that this is the most important thing that they've done in 10 years. And they don't say that lightly. This really is, I guess, the future of the company. Now, those of you with long memories will remember six years ago at Paris, was when Mercedes launched their first electric lineup. And as we all know, the future is electric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're a little bit down that road now. So we've had a chance for the major manufacturers to show us what they can do and what their thoughts are for the future. But this, to me, really is Mercedes' very first entrance into the future in terms of how it intends to stay. A lot of those first electric vehicles were more concepts or market tests to see how people would react to them. This is designed for mass market appeal. So, does it deliver? Let's take a closer look and find out. I apologize for this noise. Jonas and I had to fight slightly bear pit style to bring you this footage, but we're really excited to show you what's happening here. This is a pretty bold new future for Mercedes. As you can see, the whole way in which the front of a vehicle is presented in the electrified future is a little bit different. Gone are the massive air intakes because you don't have the water cooling system, but airflow throughout the car is still just as important as it ever was. Why? One, battery cooling, and two, with an electrified system, you really have to worry about that drag coefficient. Now that's what makes this car so very interesting and important. Shorter in total length of wheelbase than the EQS, shorter than the EQE sedan and shorter than the EQS SUV. Yes, those names are gonna take just a little bit of getting used to. But I don't know if you know this, but the longer the car is, the better the drag coefficient. So if you wanna build a car based on purely efficient use of aerodynamics, you make it long and stretch it out. So interesting that this, the mass market version of their first fully electric SUV is shorter. Why have they done that? for driving dynamics. Well, we'll have to wait till we get to the driving test to discover just how successful that's been. But in terms of pure front design, I'm a big fan of this. I think it represents a really nice mix of both the future and the past. These micro Mercedes designs that they have on the grill, really nice. Now being an older guy myself, and also being something of a bit of a fan of older vehicles when it comes to my purchasing power, I'm more than a bit interested to see how these high lacquered, highly finished surfaces will look in 10 years after being sun beaten in the coast of Barcelona. Let's find out. But until then, it looks pretty great to me. It's nice the way the sensor arrays have now been fully encompassed into the design so they're no longer awkward, bulky and standing out. Look at this lighting design. It's really fresh and dynamic. It doesn't make an insane statement like the earlier first electric vehicles did. It's stylish and it really integrates well into the total look and feel of the front of this vehicle. This really works for me. But tell me, what do you think? Four meters 86 or 191 inches, this is significantly smaller than the entire rest of its family. Why have they done that? Well, obviously for driving dynamics. Again, I'm very excited to get it on the road to find out just how that performs. Tires available and wheels, I should say, from 19 to 22 inches. Here you can see one of the specific designs. Major difference between this and the AMG version or the EQS is that it's a little bit more rugged and look and feel by design. They really want this to look a little bit more utilitarian. Here on the side, you can see the foot skirting that goes across the entire length. Apparently that's not just there for visual effect, that really helps the aerodynamic performance of the car and the drag coefficient. And on that note, I know some of those things can start to feel a little bit like they're just words, but one major change that has happened with the EQE is the introduction of a heat pump. A what? A heat pump. Why does that matter? It matters hugely because in the predecessor, Actually, that's not really fair. In the EQS, hardly a predecessor, but still, what you could find was that in cold weather, the mileage range of the car came down as far as half because of cold weather. A lot of the detractors said, well, you have to have a heat pump to combat that. Originally, Mercedes were not completely convinced by that argument. It turns out 
that they've given in. Comes pre-installed with that technology. I have to believe the EQS is going to have that delivered at a later point. 500 kilometer effective range, around about 300 miles. A lot of that is down to aerodynamic performance, but you know what I really like best? A lot of that is still down to standard engineering that we know and care about. You need a heat pump if you're going to get the best performance out of an electric vehicle. So, happy to hear that Reason took over and more than a bit excited to put this on a road to find out exactly what it really will deliver. Okay, Mercedes, I'm just a little bit mad at you. I get it. You don't want normal people to go underneath the bonnet here. That can only be accessed by your technicians. But come on, I want to have a look. I want to see what's going on. If you buy one of these things, you can't access anything under the hood. That's only taken care of by qualified Mercedes technicians. The only access point you have is here. And what does this flap do? Well, that is where you put the screen wash in. That is the beginning, middle, and end of your entire involvement with anything in the engine compartment. Rear wheels are available from 19 to 22 inches, but the real story back here is rear wheel steering. They offer up to 10%. And if you're wondering what that means in the real world, it cuts down the turning circle of this car by up to one meter. If you go with the AMG version, these tires are a little bit wider. And because of that, instead of the 10%, you get just the nine. But you do get rather a lot more power. In the top model, the AMG 53, you can expect a zero to 100 time of just 3.5 seconds. If you go with a higher DC charging rate, you should be able to go from 10 to 80% of charge in around about 30 minutes. So that's pretty competitive with what else is on the market at the moment, and honestly, more than enough for what you're likely to need to experience. Round of the back now, and this really is a knock it out of the park kind of a thing for me. Styling detail on the rear of electric cars is always something of a bit of a challenge for me, especially in the SUV segment. Why? Because you have that skateboard of batteries going underneath that give it that really big bottom third. It's always challenging to integrate that into the design so you're not focusing on that, but you still have the style and substance of the vehicle. Here, that's conveyed by this massive light cutting right across the back. Really a big fan of that. Now, an interesting styling detail. If you didn't watch Thomas's review already, this really gets me. I love these light curling loops that they fitted into the rear design. And worth noting, you get four here. If you want to go five, then you need to go upscale. You buy the one up from this, you can have five loops. It's a small detail, but that's one of the things I really like about Mercedes. They think about these things. How many people are really sitting behind you on the road thinking about that? I don't know. But if you know, you know. You know? Meanwhile, it's a really clean, bold rear. The car looks good from every direction as far as I'm concerned. This, for me, is the best EQ vehicle that Mercedes have prevented aesthetically so far. But does the interior live up to the exterior promise? Let's take a closer look and find out. Now it's time to take a look inside. Well, we have these magic disappearing handles which go right into the door. They look and feel very premium. As you can see, the Mercedes-Benz logo is featured right on top, literally in the chrome of the door. So, what would you expect? Come on, Mercedes-Benz, what is it? Nothing or the best? I've always been a bit wary of that claim because it does seem like an invitation to say, well, actually, that wasn't my experience. I guess it depends on the model that you go with. This is your first impression as you open up the door in this car. Stylish, modern, contemporary. Those are the words that leap into my head. But my first standard Mercedes-Benz test that I love to apply to all brand new Mercedes-Benz does it pass the Parmesan greater test on the back of the knuckles? Oh, it does. Happy days. Happy days. So the finish is actually as high quality as the appearance appears. But, as Thomas will have told you many times before, capacitive buttons. Now, I know Thomas hates these. I'm not quite as opposed to them as Thomas is. So I'm actually really enthusiastic to give these a little play myself and see if they're really just as tactilely irrelevant as Thomas already seems to think. So I'm gonna scoot through this pretty quickly because Thomas already went through this in a lot of depth. If you haven't checked out his static review that isn't full of a thousand people also trying to access the same car, please check it out. Seats, 
Well, number one thing I would say to you is I think the visual aesthetic of everything in this cabin is more or less faultless. It looks immaculate. Now that does come down to taste, but I am a driver first and foremost. As much as I love the visual appearance of a car, I have to know how functional and practical it is. So, leather seats here, these are clearly not standard. This, however, not working for me personally. Why? Well, you know, here I have an awful lot of sympathy with Mercedes. At the end of the day, they're entering an era that nobody's ever been in before. You have this conflict between presenting the modern world as an exciting brand new territory and producing a tool that does a job. And being a slightly older guy, I'm somewhat between point A and point B. Well, we have to talk a little bit about this screen and this for me is a little bit of a miss. Aesthetically, it's amazing. And I accept that I'm an older guy, but the problem is we sit right at the apex between things being designed to be new and futuristic and things being designed as tools to do a job. And a car fundamentally is a mode of transportation and that is its first requirement. And does it answer that brief? Well, this is the hyperscreen. So as we are static in the middle of a fair, this looks incredible. This looks like a video gamer's dream. I mean, everything from the way the steering wheel is finished to the way this screen is realized makes me feel that I'm actually at the seat of a starship. The problem I have with that is I'm not. I'm actually sitting in a car and the primary function of this car is to get me from A to B and I need to be able to access those controls in as simple and effortless a way as possible. Honestly, truthfully, I feel that where a lot of car manufacturers are struggling is they're trying to interpret the success that Tesla have had in a way that's relevant to their brand. Tesla does Tesla. Yeah, it's got faults. You might love it or hate it, but it is a market disruptor and it does a completely unique thing. This to me then is a very Mercedes response to a very Tesla solution. And I can't help but wish they'd have stuck to doing what Mercedes does best. Now, that's a little bit unfair. There are some really nice features here. This lighting strip, I mean, as you would expect with Mercedes, look at the quality of the finishing here, it's superb. The embedding of this lighting strip, which is reactive. I remember reviewing the first, I think it was 64 light zones that they put into an S-Class, and that was a long time ago. They were one of the first manufacturers to do it. It was extraordinarily expensive. It was a little pointless, but it was kind of amazing, you know? This strikes me as being a wonderful evolution of that. This light strip is fully dynamic. So this will change as you change heating and cooling, for example, and it will allow you to further embed yourself in the experience of the car. This, for me, is an immense amount of real estate providing you with information you not only don't need, but is ultimately potentially even dangerously distracting. Just take a look at this map. It's beautiful. I couldn't possibly comment or criticize the ability of Mercedes for producing something that is not only visually captivating, but extraordinary in its realization. But at the end of the day, what I want is bland and indifferent here because this is where I want my attention. So if you are an early adopter, brilliant. Try it out. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me you don't need knobs and dials and actually it works fantastically. But for the rest of us, don't panic. That's the good news. You can get the EQE with a standard display. This costs a staggering eight and a half thousand euro extra. So you don't want it. You don't have to have it. And that means that you can still connect to the car in a way that makes sense for you personally. So do I like it? Yes, I love it. But do I want it in a car? No, I do not. Very personal to me. Again, if you disagree, I am really keen to hear from you. And I'm even more excited to hear from you if you actually buy and use one of these things and tell me I'm wrong. Now, a lot of words about that. Let's cut to the chase. This looks amazing, but how is it to actually use? Well, I am concerned about all of the capacitive touch buttons that are featured within here. They all look great, but they're just not terribly practical to use. If I'm driving this car at anything close to its potential speed and I want to make an adjustment in it, 
How easy is that? Now, I'm going to disagree with Thomas slightly. These capacitive touch buttons for the seat controls here, and Mercedes have done this for an awfully long time with regular full motion buttons. These actually work really well indeed. They do move slightly, just enough to make you feel that you have actually changed something. And the response is actually pretty good. So, sorry, Thomas, I'm not going to go on board with you here. I think that's an improvement. I always thought that felt a little too cluttered and clunky with the original Mercedes design. I think that's a step forward. Now, we could talk boringly about the stereo system. I'm not going to get into that. Mercedes have spent a long time explaining to us how Dolby Atmos has been included and perfected within the vehicle. Of course, it's great. But what else would you expect? If you're going to drop this kind of cash on a car, it ought to be a little bit better than just average. And I'm telling you now, the stereo system is, yeah, get that. I'm still calling it a stereo system. But although their pitch to us tonight in the presentation is that 50% of people would rather have a better stereo system in their car than they would in their house, I drive an old car with a crappy stereo and it doesn't stop me singing my lungs out while I'm driving <laughs> at any speed around the M25 in London. So I very much doubt that it would you too. It's a nice touch to have, but a car is about driving again. So that's why I'm so excited about this heat pump being included because the bottom line is I just want the car to work. I just want to have options available to me that make me feel as if me as the driver is the most important thing. Not the passengers, they can buy their own car. But that said, this car is very well equipped, cater for them too. There's acres of storage space here, including something that everyone who's used to electric cars will be more than familiar with, this massive storage area down here. A further very large storage area up here, of course, inductive charging and USB-C technology. None of that should massively surprise you. I guess what I'm trying to say in sum is, I think the interior is fantastic. I just would like a few more knobs and dials. Is that outrageous? Am I a Luddite? Well guys, you tell me. One of the major criticisms of the forerunners, the EQE and the EQS sedan, is that there just was like no space in the back, which given that you're spending that kind of money on a luxury product, didn't make a lot of sense. Ah, this to me is a complete solution to that problem. I am one meter 68 or five foot 10 and a half, the half is important. And as you can see, I have plenty of room. I have a long torso, so you can compare my height for at least six foot one in terms of upper body space. Acres of room for the legs, as you can see, more than a little bit of space back here. And what I really like about the vehicle's design is a common thing, a uh, common problem caused by electric car design that because of that platform of batteries that's underneath the vehicle, you standardly find that even though there's plenty of leg room, your legs are raised to an uncomfortable height specifically because of those batteries, meaning that the back of your knees don't come in contact with the front of the seat. Now that's clearly irritating because if you're going for a long drive, it's just not gonna make you feel terribly good. Some car manufacturers have solved that with what they charmingly call a foot garage. Have you encountered that? Yeah, I quite like it. The reason it bothers me aesthetically is it just breaks up the flow of the footwell of the rear seat passengers. Not the biggest thing in the world, but you then are forced to choose between do you want the range on the batteries and no foot garage or do you want a foot garage and then less range? That's an impossible choice to make. I'm happy to tell you that here is a nice compromise between both. I actually can feel the back of my legs. And okay, I do not have the longest legs in the world, but as you can see, if I stretch them out, I actually still have plenty of space to room and move. So a nice compromised Mercedes between getting that depth of skateboard right and still making the rear seat passengers feel that they were included in the design. And thanks to the SUV structure, yes, the upright position still allows me the headspace that I need. Obviously, no central transmission tunnel, so I can actually realistically fit three people across the back of here. And you know what? The central seating positions are actually pretty comfortable. I have my own heating and cooling controls. It's really, really nicely finished. I'm gonna be very happy back here for quite a considerable distance.
Rear load space is 520 litres to 1,675 litres of load. So obviously you're going to be somewhat compromised by what's happening back here. He said if he can optimistically lift up the rear panel, you can see, oh, well, look at that. You've got more than a bit of underfloor storage for your charge cables, which is clearly going to come in useful. One thing I really do like about electric cars is that because of the way that they're configured, you do have zero depth entry into the rear. And that really does make a difference if you standardly have to put a lot of things back here. But look at the room that's available back here. There's more than enough space. And if you're trying to get some kind of contacts for that, well, I have to wait and see how long Mercedes will be happy about me doing this for. But as you would expect, I have to say, we've done a lot of vehicles recently where I found design details that I thought, ah, that's not great. Look at this. The finishing throughout this car, I have to say, is superb. The quality of the material is excellent. It is no less than you would expect from Mercedes, but it delivers. So here you are. I hope that seeing me back here gives you a real sense of quite what you can fit here. What I can tell you is, truthfully, personally, when I saw the EQE and the EQS, I thought, wow, those cars look amazing. But when I drove them, I thought, yeah, but could I live with this for everyday use and everyday space? And I just was not convinced. This, to me, feels like the fully realized finished version. And given the new inclusion of the heat pump, they also, by the way, have a new technology where they've disconnected by use of a clutch, if you get an all-wheel drive version, the front axle, that leads to an extra 10% of efficiency on drive. That helps you achieve that realistic real-world usage, hopefully, of 500 kilometers to 300 miles. Not only is this a car that I can live with in terms of its usability, but it's a car that I think I would be very, very happy to own. Now, all of that's outside of the price point. I guess what I'm saying to you is, if you can afford one of these things, I think you're going to be really happy. It's a little outside of my price range. How about yours? Well, Thomas already featured it quite a lot. So I didn't want to spend too long talking about the AMG version, but I did want to give you just a little bit of a taste of the change of design and the way in which the flare is different in this vehicle. So more dynamic, more aggressive, more sporty. You get the idea. But I have to tell you, from what I've seen tonight, from my experience so far, the EQE is the one that I am most keen to try out. The standard base level model, no frills, no bows. I can't wait to get that on the road. Meanwhile, check out Thomas's review and take a look at some of the competitors because they have some interesting features to offer too.